five years ago. So what we're seeing here is the, the page uh, of our repository, Fabricatable Machines is the name of the project. And it comes from, you know, there's some licenses, you know, you, you describe it, if you have a summary for normal people to read, it's human readable text, not lawyer readable text. So the, this is human fabricatable machines. It means that without a lot of skills uh, or sophisticated machinery, you can build this yourself with regular access to regular fab lab tools. So, and we are a, a, a team of uh, contributors to the project. So if you go to contributors here in the repo, you can see uh, this is me, Jan Stevik, and you're also going to later meet Jakob Nilsson, uh, and you're going to meet Torbjörg Norvig Helgesen, who's going to do a demo of one of the machines in about a uh, minutes. So what makes the Fabricatable Machines project unique is that we really focused on, on how we can make as much as possible of all the core components of the machines yourself from scratch. Uh, we focused more on the physical side than the software control side yet. So on this uh, illustration here, uh, you can see how we have individual fabricatable modules that we develop that come together, like the you know, bearing, positioning, rack, and so on, come together to form individual fabricatable axes. And these, again, can be put together and combined to create uh, complete uh, fabricatable machines, machines that almost anyone can make and customize. And you can see here the red parts in the illustration is then what is added custom to, to merge these axes together. Uh, I want to mention a very exciting uh, thing is that we just had a, our first publication out, uh, uh, an article on, on uh, presented at TAI 2020, uh, Fabricatable Machines, the toolkit for building digital fabrication machines. So, mentored by Nadia Peek, a former uh, PhD student of Neil, which is very nice. Uh, uh, that's available in the link in, in the repo. Um, so if we go first, let's start with the uh, fabricatable modules, then we're going to see how that forms fabricatable axes, and in the end have a little bit uh, look at how that makes complete machines. Uh, so uh, one of the core components we developed is what we describe as a CNC-friendly rack and pinion. So it's a, a little bit of a unique geometry that makes if you want to have a direct driven uh, positioning of a machine, then uh, by, by this, uh, using this rack and pinion instead of involute, you get uh, more torque and, and precision. Uh, or even you can use larger milling bits uh, so it can be made faster. And you see we've you know, published in a lot of different formats. Uh, one exciting development is that I got a lot better at FreeCAD. So you can see here we have a fully parametric FreeCAD model available in the repo. So on the right side, you see all the spreadsheet aliases, the main adjustments and advanced adjustments. So lots more FreeCAD uh, coming up, uh, fully open source design software. And here you can see uh, rack modules meeting each other on, on one of the machines. Uh, we also developed uh, internal external gears for the same uh, type of geometry, CNC friendly gears for you know, rotary axes and so on. Um, and, and not only do we have then the parametric generators, but we publish also a lot of uh, different size ratios ready made. Uh, a quite new development is this uh, humble little eccentric brushing that you 3D print. Uh, so by 3D printing this one, uh, you can do fine adjustment uh, of, of, of a bearing riding on an axis. And uh, oh, time is running fast. This is for bootstrapping. We made a, a control shield for working with durable on the model, and you can see it's both. You can see and simulate yourself as well as uh, order it from a board house. And the new developments, belt-driven rack and pinion with bearings for teeth. Uh, let's go back and see how all this comes together to form individual axes. So we are right now in a refresh, a new generation of, of fabricable axes is coming up, so new generators. The one we made in 2017 was used by how to make students and public academy students. But the sham for rail had too much friction. New, new system coming up soon, but for now, this is the documentation. So we identified three main axes for DIY machine building. So a rigid axis for fast fabrication of, of uh, rigid machines, an FX axis, very much inspired by Jake Reed's work. Uh, a bootstrap axis that you can make without access to a laser cutter or a large format milling machine, and what I call a proper axis for making machines for industrial use. So here you can see a, a rigid ax axis in aluminium immersion. You will see that one in use in a few minutes uh, on uh, Humphrey. And, and again, uh, just under 10 minutes per topic. Yes. So 
So I think I'm running on five minutes now, right? Uh, and then, yeah, all, uh, you know, here you see bootstrap access that you can make with good working tools and, and 3D printed parts. And then the proper access, you know, with linear rails and gear backing pin and those. And all of this comes together to form fabricable machines, uh, the whole machines. So here you see all the axes come together to make a metal Humphrey and a wooden Humphrey. And if we browse down here through the machine family, there's lots of history to look at just wanted to browse all the way down to future machines. So here we home friendly CNC. So here you see that sort of printer sized, shapeoko sized, chocolate sized machines can be laser cut around here. The dust extraction is enclosed inside the same environment as the other machines. So could be very relevant for having uh, fab lab type capabilities in office and home environments. And uh, we're not going to look too much into the detailed documentation of each of the machines because there's no time for that. But if you, you know, if you, if you click the links, you can, you know, you find the bill of materials, uh, cut sheets, uh, so on and so on. Lots of history of how it was made. Uh, so, uh, my favorite machine so far is this, you know, large format milling machine because it's equally as big as the one that made it. And our sort of philosophy is we'll keep making classic three axis machines until we have a very good axis system, which then can be used for all kinds of future new type of machines. So I'm going to uh, leave the presentation now over to Jakob Nilsson and to the who's going to do a demo of this sample machine. Yeah, and before you go on, one request. Your favorite picture I love is where you show the parts you buy versus the parts you make, and you show each year the ones moving from one side to the other. I think there's a really nice gra graphic you could do of how that boundary uh, keeps receding. Yes, uh, that was for this guy here, Hank. Uh, and, and we haven't gotten the idea that we the modeling, but it is super nice. Huh? One second there. Here you see. So on the left side is the parts you buy, and the right side the parts you make. And I think there's a nice exercise just to show sort of e each year what goes on one side of the boundary and what goes on the other side of the boundary. Okay, yes. Yeah, oh. Then, if Jens stops his screen sharing, we will show a live machine demo with a full size machine. Uh, and yes, I guess we are on. Since we start making noise, we should go become the main viewing viewing window. If everything's good. If you start the machine. We did have a connection problem, and uh, uh, the uh, Windows machine that we're using fell asleep. So uh, it's in C uh, mode. So uh, Jakob is trying to do that. So in the meantime, I will show you our machine. This is how the M3 looks. And it was commissioned last year. And as we can see, most of the parts are made from aluminum top. I'll be very close. And so this is located in a school, and uh, it's been used basically every day to make students uh, protect. So. They are mainly using it for aluminum and carbon fiber. So pieces like this. And we use um, aluminum extrusions for practicality because that's the most easy material to handle instead of big sheets of metal. And uh, 
Aluminium is really easy to machine and uh, weld. So now I mentioned some. Oh, no, no. Also. This is again the metal version, and although it takes a bit longer to, to manufacture it, it's uh, far easier to uh, uh, to operate as it's way more uh, rigorous. And at school, uh, we appreciate that rigidity and uh, the fact that we can manufacture uh, replacement parts. So, Jacob, for time, if you need a little more to boot it up, we should go on and then just come back when it's running. It would be fantastic. Let's, let's just come back to us, us machining later. I'll give you a note in the chat. Okay, good. Just uh, speak up when it's running. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so next we're going to go to Once Upon a Time, there was an Italian engineer who took a Fab Academy class. So what happened after that, Danielle? Hi, everybody. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Yeah, as Neil was uh, saying, after my Fab Academy, uh, I started making a lot of experimentations about um, drones and also about making machines. So this presentation will show you a little bit of what I did um, just after the course. So I did Fab Academy in, in 2015, and that was my chance to finally um, uh, have hands-on on the publication and to start experimenting with, with hardware before I was just a computer scientist. Um, you can consider me like a guy that makes things just following his things and his hands, not really deeply knowing what he's doing. So that's the way that I, I made all these machines, uh, just like the valuable man of uh, Philip Dick. Uh, during Fab Academy, I developed a drone uh, able to avoid obstacles that then spun off in many other open source drones projects and workshops. So also the implementation of the file controller became a full project on its own, uh, the file controller I developed during Fab Academy. Um, this project is focused on developing uh, general purpose open source electronics. Uh, they are called the sub with the fiber one and simplifying the overall design. Uh, Laser 2 has been released uh, on GitHub. My second machine is BigFDM, uh, that is an open source, large scale 3D printers. Um, this machine was designed and proposed as a personal challenge and to fulfill the requirement of a workshop. Uh, its development took only two months of spare time. So Big FDM must be designed with a top-down approach in this, time, in this case. So you, I designed the overall frame uh, and then uh, everything inside it. It offers a scalable design and a lower price in comparison to commercial machines. And um, um, it, its, design, its design maximizes the printing area while keeping the housing as small as possible to reduce the costs. The stages of Big FDM are designed to be independent with the objective of reusing their design for new machines. So the overall bill of material is around uh, $3,000, and the machine has already been released in GitHub. My last machine is a small laser cutter called Fabulaser. Especially developed to be a valid laser alternative for Fab Lab schools, it has a cutting area of 600 by 400 millimeters, a 4-watt la laser, and can cut up to 6 millimeter acrylic, and it is offered as a kit. So one machine kit can be manufactured in three days, and we are currently thinking about commercial plants for it. 
So what's the fun of building replicable machines if you could not share it with others? Uh, you might also think it uh, as a different business model where you uh, just don't sell the machines, but you sell together the machines and the knowledge to build them. So all my machines have been built by university students. So this means I've, I've been uh, to their place, manufacture the parts there, and assemble the machine uh, with them. Some of the participants of this uh, course are now enrolled uh, in the ZF Academy. So last semester, I've been teaching a local machine building class as an experiment. Uh, the, the class had only three participants and was 10 hours per week. And the students were able to deliver three fully working machines and relative documentation about their making of. The structure of the course is a scaled down version of the Fab Academy, where students have to deal with weekly assignments. And their machine is their final project. The machines were two desktop CNC's and one 3D printer. Their bill of material ranges in about $150 each. And links uh, of the documentation are in the machine, machine recitation page, if you would like to get them. Um, so my machine ba making activities brought me funds to have my own fab lab. Uh, that was a dream when I was doing Fab Academy. Uh, so plans are to involve more and more people into machine building, use it as manufacturing facilities for open source machine and future experimentations. The shop offers uh, standards fab lab equipment, and it has two floors. So the upper floor will be a guest house for people interested in machine building internship uh, in the future. So a big thanks to what happened to me in my machine building journeys, FabLab Company Imports, OpenLab Hamburg, FabLab UAE, uh, UAE uh, Hashim, and Ahmed. And now I will stop my um, uh, screen sharing because I would like to show you the machines live. I hope this time my demo works. So this is uh, the first machine that we're showing on the slide. There is a small piece of wood inside. And I will start the printer. I hope they're not too much loud. Yeah. And now I will start the job. So now you can see the machine uh, cutting. Um, so the machine is cutting at 700 millimeter per minute, and it's cutting uh, 5 millimeter uh, uh, line. And it's uh, cutting the public logo while it's engraving uh, a big tanks. Uh, it's marking a big tanks for the public, and then we'll cut out the overall uh, the overall logo. So for the next day, we'll have very loud filters. So I will not be able to talk over it. Uh, so I will mute. But I will try to show later Duo with a nice feature, which is out of focus. So I have three different materials inside, of which the one is 27 millimeter uh, uh, plywood, and it's going to cut all three materials. So let's see the piece. That is ready over here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then let's start the other filters. And so here is laser glue with three pieces inside, 80 millimeter uh, plywood, 12 millimeter acrylic, and 27 millimeter uh, multiple. So I will mute myself. Just a small note, the, the focus will change automatically between switching the materials. So now it's 8 millimeter, then it will go to 12, and then to 27.
So I think it's time to look the results. Let's open. Sorry, there will be a little bit of more. But, uh, so tanks have been cut too. Uh, you can see here uh, the pieces. Wait a moment. Let's see if I can remove uh, one piece from it. So here is one piece. And of course, I hope that also the rest has been cut through. Yeah, and this one, for some reason, uh, has not. And also this one has not. OK, sorry. Okay. Yeah, there are yeah. other pieces that I cut before. They were OK, but for some reason, demo time is always hard. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, D D Danielle, it's fabulous work. And I'm really struck that both you and Jens uh, became machine builders. And one of the results for both of you was building a whole lab to, to, to go around the machines you're building. Um, uh, Jakob, I see you're cutting now. Do you want to? If uh, why don't you get the audio unmute and get the audio focus? Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank you, Danielle. We are ready to mail if we are allowed to. Still. Yeah, go ahead, please. Just want to say my girlfriend pushed a little bit the material and it has come off. Ah, so. <laughs> Here is the other one. Okay, uh, this is fabulous. Okay, next one we're going to go to is a late edition. This wasn't originally planned for this recitation, but as part of the shutdown response, Barcelona accelerated making a uh, mini machine aimed for every student to have their own machine, something far in the future of Fab Labs. So I wanted them to present. The rest of the Fab Academy is seeing this, but I wanted them to present to the other machine builders. So, um, Eduardo Santi, take over. Yep. Um, well, hello, I'm Eduardo. I'm going to speak on behalf of the whole Barcelona team, Oscar, Xavi, Santi, and Josep. So, uh, with the COVID, you know that it has seriously hit Spain. And we were asking ourselves the question how we can make the lab reach to the students and not the students reach to the lab. So, we started with how we can make the simplest, cheapest, and most portable machine ever. And we found out that uh, widely in the market, you can find these small like stepper motors for the like, common electronic device. This is a DVD room, DVD room like a steppers. And thanks to our friends in Shenzhen, they, can, they already provide some kind of mini sliders for making machines. And we asked ourselves, OK, can we build a machine based on that? So we start making a mock-up and redesign it. And we finally made that, OK, we can actually make a machine under 80 euros, the total. And it's almost fully fabricatable, except of the rails. Uh, in this case, we have, think, we have thought that the machine could be made out of acrylic completely, or the machine is around 150 by 100 by no, 100. I'm not barking, I'm on a call. So actually, it could be just print as one part in a standard FDM printer. So it's a really, really small machine but that could serve as a small million of mini PCBs or like small wax molds made out of soap. So some the students can actually make them from home or they can either modify them. Well, the name comes because it's actually almost the same size as a six pack of cans. And we, we found out that it was a really fancy name. Just right now we have fully developed the, all the digital plans and fabrication ones because our lab is still closed. And the parts are reaching along this week, so we plan to actually assemble for next week. Just to have a comparison of size to all the other machines, <laughs> this is the big FDM of Daniel. It's a really cute, small, and actually fits in a backpack. 
Uh, we try to make it as simple as possible, and here in the repo, actually, we like that this project is contributed and everybody is open to fork it and modify. You can see all the plans, files, and etc. Uh, unable to make it as simple as possible, our students already design and fabricate or like own version of the we call the Arduino that is a uh, ESP compatible Arduino board, and we have make a whole ecosystem just around it. So actually, we are right now in the version 2.2 that we have simplified the footprints to make easy to solder. We have included the PDI, so it's a like power boosted Arduino compatible board with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities because we love the ESP32. So here in the repo, you can see all the development, all the pinouts and how to use it. And actually, all the students they are they have unlucky right now the 2.0 version, not the 2.2. Uh, they have at home and they have made all the assignments until now, the date, with this board. And they are happy, quite happy with it. So we thought, okay, why, how can we involve, involve the Arduino into this small machine? So we, again, we developed a machine shield. So actually, we can use the same board that they already have to move the machine they have at home. So they can either take out the Arduino shield to make their assignments, or they can um, produce the two-sided uh, board, uh, two-sided driver board to control the own machine. So here again, we have already the design of this board is finished and we are producing it. Uh, those, because of lab construction, we have ordered the fabrication and also to make the timing shorter because we are running out of time right now. And we are already included all of the, the casing, protecting it, etc. Uh, in order to make our students' life easier, we have also taken of, okay, we have designed it a small G-code parser, so it's a WebGL parser, so they can visualize if the G-codes they have produced, because they have been testing a lot of manually coded G-codes, and it's something that we have focused here. So if you just throw a standard G-code into the file, you can visualize if the G-code is correctly, and you can check for mistakes before launching the machine, and double check everything, look. check twice, but once. Um, based on this project, right now our students have made some spin-offs, and right now we have two of them. One is going to be, as far as I remember, a light painting machine. So based on the same system, they have start making their own custom parts and design. Uh, I think is Daniel and uh, David team, uh, and two, two and David, sorry. Uh, they are going to make or try to make for this machine assignment a light painting machine based on the three axes, so they can able to shot. Uh, three-dimensional drawings based on long-term exposure photography. Actually, the read documentation is quite good and is quite advanced and has explained what he understands of ERVL, the meter shields, how to modify them. So anyone that has questions about how to build a machine is quite good documentation and recommended to go for it. Um, second spin-off will be Arman and Daniel, yes, in this case. They actually, the motivation is to transform the super small <laughs> SPML into actually as really even a smaller one, five axis CNC. That is something that we were really surprised because this kind of machine increase has a lot of complexity. The recommendation is, of course, working in progress, but they have already an idea of what part we can embed it, and they are using the standard like micro meter steppers to actually enable five axis on their machines. So actually, the machines are not, well, we have made us the most of the parts that we could do, and we are just missing a few components, so we are able to run it. And we will invite, we want to invite everybody in the network to actually contribute as they want and make a spin off and modification of this machine, because we consider that this kind of machine if that could be even run on batteries due to small stepper size and power to requirements. It would be really nice to have a super personal portable mini lab. Uh, th this is great. This is really important for the Fab Lab future. Uh, one thing I'd suggest when you get the parts is to stress test, like run run an axis nonstop for a week to see how the um, backlash, how the resolution holds up to that will be an important question. Yep. Thank yep. you. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Nadia, are you on and ready? I'm on. Perhaps great. I am ready. So, um, let's see, once upon a time there was a artist designer from the Netherlands and who helped kick off this whole idea of machine building. So, Nadia, take over. Hello, Fab Academy. 
Um, good morning, or at least here it is 6.30 a.m. I drank a lot of coffee. Um, Neil is, you know, great and was my advisor, and I spent a bajillion years working in the basement at the Center for Bits and Atoms. But if there's one thing that I really want you all to remember, Fab Academy, is that Neil is mostly wrong. All the time he tells you to do things like this should be part of machines or this is the most important part of your project and you really shouldn't listen to him because he just has ideas and uh, a lot of them are based on you know a slight distortion of reality <laughs> so um, I am now a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle so fortunately far away from the Center for Bits Adams and sometimes I definitely miss some of the aspects of the basement. Um, but now in my lab, which is called Machine Agency, I can really focus on how we can harness the precision of machines for the creativity of individuals, which I think is actually a little bit different than what, um, what a lot of machines you might find in Fab Academy commercial and off-the-shelf machines focus on. There it's maybe uh, making an industrial process um, cheaper or making uh, an existing process faster. But what I'm really interested in is how can you use machines to creatively solve problems instead of spending a lot of time making a machine and then automating something, um, can you really quickly use automation as a way to really precisely solve problems. But yeah, some ancient history. So uh, with Jonathan Ward, who unfortunately can't be here today, there was the MTM Snap, which was maybe the first Fab Lab um, make a milling machine with a milling machine project. There was also Pop Fab, the portable um, pop up um, milling machine slash 3D printer slash a bunch of other machines. And the cool thing about this was we introduced um, Core XY kinematics and uh, kinematic mount for changing tools. Um, and then also, uh, modular machines, so reconfigurable stages for making um, different kinds of machine configurations ad hoc. And all that was great, um, cool machines, whatever, uh, but the big problem was that nobody was actually making these. Nobody was actually using these for any particular application. It was just me and other people like me who were working in the basement at MIT, and not other people. And so uh, James Coleman and I, who were working on the modular machines at the time, realized that the big, the big barrier is documentation. How do you get other people to replicate your work? And not just documentation, but how do you make sure that they can source the parts that uh, you design with? So on the left is an excerpt of our documentation of the cardboard machine kit, and on the right is uh, a tube cutting cardboard machine from. Uh, the Fab Lab, a Fab Lab in South America, where um, being able to start from a project and its documentation and being able to customize it for an application specific task. Uh, I thought it was super exciting. Um, and so there I started realizing that to be able to get other people involved in machine building, teaching workshops and creating valuable documentation and also making sure that the materials that you use in designing the machines were accessible. The machines that I showed before, they're all made with water jet cutters or really big milling machines or tools that maybe aren't that easy to use. Um, and so what I think is important is to figure out like how can we have access to this precision of computer control but without necessarily relying on really uh, specific infrastructure. So here are a bunch of different machines that the Fab Academy world made um, using a cardboard machine kit. And so now in my lab, to continue focusing on this question of like how do we make it as, uh, as easy as possible to use automation for creative tasks, um, I'm going to talk about one specific project, or maybe a few specific projects, um, where we're, we're, we're taking inspiration from Fedeskar said that and Turgeon and Jakob and Jens uh, of like what does it mean to be fabricatable? And what does it mean for uh, you to be able to use totally different 
uh, machine configurations. So this is an interface that one of my students, Jasper, is using to be able to project directly into the work envelope so you can preview what a machine is doing at any given time. Or uh, programming languages to be able to describe machines so that you can quickly generate controllers from it. Uh, Julie is sort of a, 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 a really eat-your-own-dog-food version of fabricatability where we want to be able to ensure that people with access to maybe the lowest common denominator of fab lab equipment is able to produce the machine. So it is a, um, it is a machine that's made out of extrusion and laser cut parts and 3D printed parts um, and is a uh, and, and, and requires not the, the documentation requires not necessarily a lot of expertise on behalf of the user um, slash machine builder as they're assembling. And I think that's really a crucial component. How do you really have something that is fabricatable? Thanks, Norway, for inventing that word. <laughs> um, so at Fab 15, for example, we were testing um, the assembly of it. And those of you who were there, I see Rico is on, some other people. Um, remember that there was a, we had to spend a lot of time waiting for parts, but then once we got the parts, that the tools that we had um, at the FabLab conference were sufficient to be able to build components for the tool changing head. Fortunately, due to luggage problems, we never actually moved the machine around at the end, but we would have if we hadn't gotten kicked out of the lab. Boo. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important to realize here is that just because you're making things out of low-cost parts and with accessible machines doesn't mean you need a loss of precision. So here um, is the kinematic mount that we're using to uh, locate the tools. So you see, this is maybe something that Neil also talked about in um, machine class, where you have, you have exactly three points of contact uh, sorry, exactly six points of contact between these three balls and these three slots um, so that you're always positioning a rigid body without any ability to move in six degrees of freedom. So when we drop off and pick up a tool using this machine, um, we have repeatability within 40 micrometers um, or on the order of 40 micrometers. And so even though this is 3D printed on, not necessarily a fancy um, not necessarily a fancy 3D printer and using not necessarily fancy off-the-shelf parts, the resulting structure that you get is high performing. And then there I think it's also important to remember that machines go beyond the hardware. You're trying to do something with the machine. So what about all of the other components? It doesn't really matter if you make a new 3D printer if the point of your task is that you wanted to do something different with the 3D printer. So how does the software um, and how does the result analysis factor into that? Um, so here are a bunch of different heads that we made for Jubilee. Um, so the microscope gigapen head, um, the way that the tool locking works is a torque-based system, so you have a spring that basically is twisting the locking mechanism, and as the spring stretches, it hits an end stop, um, and once it hits the end stop, you know that you have pulled it tight enough and that the tool is now locked. Um, that can wear over time, but in this, in this implementation, that doesn't matter. Um, we can pick up different kinds of syringe heads um, for liquid handling, and we can do multi-material 3D printing. Uh, I think the multi-material 3D printing is the part that uh, the community is definitely most excited about. Um, and that was definitely the reason that there was the first replication. So when we, um, when we have finished the first round of documentation for Jubilee, um, I think Joshua had put the like, please build this now on our wish on our wiki on November in November. And by December, someone we didn't know had already replicated um, the machine Denal in Texas. And that was extremely exciting because that meant that the documentation that we produced in the build materials was sufficient for people to be able to start replicating the work without our involvement. Um, and since then, uh, 20 sites of people that we have never met, um, and depending on how this pandemic goes, maybe you never will, no, just kidding, <laughs> the, uh, have managed to replicate the machine and are getting high performance results. 
they're all really excited about multi-material 3D printing, but there are also a bunch of people who are trying to use this machine for other applications. Nadia, uh, time click. This is my last slide. Uh, and so one thing I also think is important in the urgency of now uh, is here are a bunch of my students. We all have machines at home and are figuring out how to work in this new, uh, in this new world. And they're um, like being able to reimagine what using machines is and where we use them and how we use them. Um, I think it's a, a really, a really urgent thing for now. So thanks. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, that's great. Um, lots of questions for everybody speaking in the chat. We need to keep going for time. But yeah, Nadia, it's absolutely true. We've been seeing in all sorts of ways the pandemic is forcing the future of labs to come faster than we expected. Um, so, uh, questions to Nadia in the chat. Jake, take over. Jake is not exactly, but loosely, Nadia's successor in the basement. And again, started as a designer, not a machine builder, and um, uh, through an interesting history, became a super machine builder. So, Jake, take over. Hey, everyone. What's that? I'm a designer. I agree in artificial intelligence. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, everyone's pretty much done a great job introducing the themes. We're all familiar. We want to make machines for ourselves to do automation, creative work, whatever. Um, so, uh, I started as a mechanical engineer, um, and I'll walk through one or two of my mechanical, like new mechanical designs. And then, uh, to what Nadia was saying at the end, machines are a lot more than just, um, the, uh, the the mechatronics of it. You also have to look write a lot of software. Um, the controllers are continually difficult. Um, so uh, after the machine parts, I'll talk about the control work that I've been working on. Um, so in terms of fabricable axes, um, this is my latest. Uh, I had done a lot of work previously, similar to what Nani was saying with water jets and stuff like that. Um, and eventually thought this should all be easy. Um, so this this is a design that I uh, actually quite like, which is just 3D printed and laser cut. Um, and the bill of materials involves uh, like one type of roller bearing um, and GT2 six millimeter uh, pulley, which we're all used to. Um, so these are, uh, I'm a big fan. Um, I've also done some work to, like Nadi was saying, make a lot of good documentation. So there are exploded drawings, um, a Rhino model that's sort of assembly complete, and then I have a build of materials here, um, and a few pretty drawings. Um, this was the basis, the mechanical basis for um, what we did in Machine Week in, uh, at MIT this year, um, where a group of students made this uh, Apple Wave. Um, so each of these axes are sort of actually a collection of different modular axes I've made before, uh, rearranged. And then the spindle here is actually a, a rotary end effector that I had designed that then became a, an apple spindle head. Um, so uh, this is a great use of like modular elements to make a machine that uh, I hadn't thought about making before. Um, those are those. And then uh, I have also been working on a tool changer. Um, so the big thing I was interested in was um, having a higher retention force, um, and then also being able to make this with less uh, purchase parts. So um, here, uh, the contacts are just button head pass screws, and the only sort of like remotely new uh, components you need to purchase are um, these um, dowel pins, which are used for one of the kinematic slots. Um, so this is right now on my newest machine. Um, I think it'll be easy to automate that. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm psyched to go forward with that. Um, and then uh, I moved back to Canada um, during the pandemic. And I really wanted to build machines, which at the time for me meant um, using a lot of sheet stock. Um, so I'd uh, been a big fan of Phenolic. Um, and 
I wanted to mill Phenolic, didn't have a mill, had a 3D printer, so I thought sort of a fun side exercise is can I build like a 4x8 router with just a 3D printer? Um, so this is the, um, call it the ratchet. Um, all of the mechanical parts are printed. Uh, the chassis sort of is just another sheet of 4x8. Um, I've got Solver's legs. And um, uh, this is also all together, getting ready to move it. Um, it has a reduced drive, uh, some stiff belts. Um, so that's also new. Um, these, these are all on mtm.cba. So then with the last slice of time, um, I'll talk about Squidworks, which uh, this was the project I did for, um, which became my master's thesis at Neil's lab. Um, so I have a small video. Um, basically, we've all used mods. So Neil pretty much said, what if we had mods inside of microcontrollers? Um, and then I went crazy trying to figure out how to make that uh, real. Um, the key sort of insight is that the networks that we use to control the, um, uh, the networks we use to pass data along the collection of like modular hardware elements is sort of self-similar to the data flow network. So they work together. Um, so here's an environment um, that's being rendered in JavaScript that's running across the whole machine. Um, and I can add little blocks of code, uh, just like you can in mods. But then here I can also sort of dive down a layer, and I can start rendering the code that's running in um, a controller that's one or two network hops away from me, or three or four. Um, so the idea is you want to be able to like throw controllers together without looking at any code, without uploading any firmware. Um, you just kind of poke everything in your uh, physical network and discover what they do. Um, and then we're also really excited about being able to send data back. So uh, this is just a short demo of um, pulling torque values back from a motor as it's accelerating and decelerating. Um, so being able to like quickly plot, uh, like Nani was talking about, get data, have test results. Um, machines are really parts of sort of bigger ecosystems. We want to be able to plug in um, on both ends. Um, and then one, one of the big challenges, challenges here was um, having confident motion control, control work across the network. network. Each, Each of these motors has its own, you know, idea of what time is in synchronization. So successfully taking a, a path plan, move, splitting it up into all the motors and having them execute them sort of successfully is tough. Um, but, but this is finally fun working, so uh, here's my motion control demo. Um, I think this is a few months ago now. Um, and this is an earlier version of the sort of fabricable uh, axes that were water jet and 3D printed. Um, so, how is that? Um, there is a good amount of documentation for Squidverse. Uh, it's all sort of explained here. Um, and um, I wouldn't say it's go make it yourself right away, please. Um, I'm working on sort of a third version, and I would say I'm 90% of the way through. Um, so that's my idea. Also, the hardware that goes with the software that you've been developing, the boards. Right, yeah. So, of course, everything runs on also circuits. Um, and so I have a router. Uh, this, this thing, which I really, really like this approach, this is a little isolated module, um, which just includes the SAM D51, which is our favorite microcontroller, um, and then I, um, I reflow that onto another board. So, uh, uh, so these, in my next version, I'm planning on having them sort of mass produce, and then when I want to, like, you know, dead bug a circuit, um, or put it on a new uh, circuit I make in the lab, It'll be easy. Um, and yeah, yeah there's a motor, motor driver, driver. There's a brushless motor driver, driver in the works. Um, there's a router. There was a breadboard board, a DC driver. Um, they're all sort of like lost in America. Okay. So, so what Jake is doing um, builds on Nadia and Alan to distribute code over the system. So rather than having it baked into the 
a decode interpreter where it's hard to add a motor or a sensor, you distribute the computing through the system. Uh, on the recitation page, there's a link to a rumbu, which is something that emerged in the boot camp in Kerala, which is the opposite extreme. This is a working project with people like Chris and Denny, where um, uh, we had looked at with interface speeds and processor speeds increasing, whether purely in software you can send step and direction out to um, degrees of freedom in a machine uh, fast enough for the software to remove all intelligence from the machine. And the numbers were actually really promising to extremely simplify simple machine building. And so there's a link to the Arumbu project on the page, and um, we'll talk more about that in the machine building in the Fab Academy. But, but for time now, let's go to Marcin to wrap up to talk about um, broader implications of machine building. Take over. Yeah, excellent. Do I have seven or ten minutes? Are we cutting off sharp in nine or? Uh, take, take ten minutes. We'll go a few minutes. Okay, excellent. So my name is Marcin from Open Source Ecology. Let me share my screen um, on my presentation. Okay. Okay, so I work on the global village construction set. The theme of modularity and scalability and construction set approach runs rampant throughout. So I'm, I was glad to see that just about everybody has a universal axis. Hey, that's excellent. Uh, so do we. Uh, but we work on larger machines and applications of how you bootstrap from CNC machines to larger machines like CNC torch tables to building real machines for the infrastructures of civilization. So you can look at my TED talk on the Global Village construction set. Uh, it's all linked. We're, we're about, just for reference, we're about 30% done with the entire system. So we've d done things like prototype the 3D printer, houses, brick presses, power cubes, tractors, and other machines. But yeah, it's a big ambitious project I've been working on for a decade. Right now we have a couple of products like, and here I, I emphasize, this is the universal axis. So this is our, our version of, a, of an item, the XYZ axis that can be put into printers. These are actually printers we sell right now. So this is the D3D Pro, which has got the standard gantry system on top and uh, Zs like this. Or you can do a very simple machine with three axes just like this. And I think different than, and I challenge everybody in a, in a crew here, we have 14 unique parts in the universal axis. So we claim this is the simplest thing in the world that you can do but uh, I'd like to see the part count for the other ones myself. So you can actually scale this. This is a six foot tall machine that we built uh, or this one cubic meter printer that we built using the same small eight millimeter axis, but then we can scale up. We can go up to uh, the same axis, same concept, but take a larger rod, like a one inch 25 millimeter rods to do large, larger items like this CNC torch table. So it's another thing, we, this is 2017. Or you can even scale that up, the same kind of concept of rods and bushings to do two inch or 50 millimeter size axes for heavy duty CNC, such as this uh, project. We didn't finish this, but this is where we got to. So we, we talk about uh, how does this all relate? So with a torch table, uh, you can now start cutting metal. So that's exactly what we do. And we build things like the tractors. So, so uh, like the, the teeth here are CNC cut and things like that. Or we can make brick presses or houses with the machines that we produce, like the brick press and tractor. We build houses too. So this is what we do here is this is actually a, just to give you an example of what modularity can do. This is all panelized construction built in five days with 50 people. And this is actually where I am right now. This is where I'm speaking from. That's that's my house here. Or we can build uh, aquaponic greenhouses. Uh, it's related to some of the work that we do. So we all do this in an open source micro factory. Uh, we focus on metal. Our favorite tool is uh, we, we're kind of partial to metal. So just to review this basic product ecology, you've got 3D printers that make parts for the larger axes like a, like a torch table. You can make machines. But then how do you start closing the loop back to the circular economy. So that's, we care a lot about ecology. So uh, that's where we add some other machines like shredders, uh, filament makers, extruders, induction furnaces. So you can grind your cars, tractors, electronics, and everything with a shredder, melt it down either as metal or as plastic and extrude it through metal rolling. And then you can go back to making metal parts that go into your CNC machines and thereby closing the loop. 
but so that is taking the full ecology of products from cradle to grave and also you can do do more with that because we literally say that from rocks sunlight plants soil water you can build just about anything soil well soil is is earth it's clay clay can be used to make the bricks that we do or it can be used to make aluminum Alum clay is aluminum silicate so with a with a aluminum extractor machine which is actually the last machine in our set you can go literally from the dirt to metal through technology that we're trying to reduce to a small scale and we focus on modularity so what i want to show here with this 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 is our universal motor you can say this is like the machine uh equivalent of the universal axis it's a rotary axis here um, very modular device that we use in in many many machines i'll show how it's used here's a power cube and a modular power unit now here's what i want to emphasize the power cube goes on the back of the tractor for power and this universal rotor spins both the the trencher here or the wheel drive units right there same thing so focusing on modularity and the absolute constru construction set approach or a smaller tractor with the power cube sitting right in there and tracks and, and motors that are similar we focus on the construction set approach and that applies we found not only t uh, works with things like the universal axes but also with all kinds of things like the heavier machines or electrons or everything else so if anything you get anything out of this this conversation here is design things along a construction set approach so that instead of being able to build only one thing with your technology set you can build many things. You can build a tractor, a bulldozer, a backhoe, or anything. Or you can make a CNC machine of one type or any other. Constru mm. Construction set approach is, is uh, very important. And, and now, um, I want to point out this. Like, you can get down to literally like silicon digital age technology. So the, this is an air bearing lathe. This is Dan. Uh, this is, you can see the link and what I have there. But you can actually make air bearings. You can go all the way up to... Uh, bootstrapping civilization to making air bearings pretty much on a home scale so this is um, pretty impressive as far as what ca all can be done with technology that's made appropriate so I mentioned the aluminum extraction so clay that makes bricks for houses it makes um, makes clay as in stuff you can make ceramics with if you bake it at high temperature or you can extract the aluminum silicate you can take the aluminum from that using the, the standard hull hero process but that's the limit of all that can be done on a small scale using uh, appropriate technology so actually i, I kind of gone through all um, all of my presentation as it is so i can actually quit right there can, there's much more so to it i hadn't appreciated the extent, the extent I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with the gingery series of books um, yeah I yeah. hadn't appreciated the extent to which you're really filling in that roadmap of going from dirt to the machine shop to civilization. Yeah, 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 by all means. Um, so, yeah, it was just a couple minutes to wrap up, and this is such a dream team on this call. Uh, one of my goals is to figure out how to share across all of you. There's so much. It, it, it's great the diversity and then figuring out how to share across it and then what does this all imply for getting to a million fab labs for, for democratizing access um we have just a few minutes for those questions um any of the machine builders thoughts on how this all relates and where it leads well absolutely like i, I want to pipe in that there's what I found in this lecture, in this presentation, this hour is that, wow, there's so much good work out there. But at the end of the day, it's about realistic economic models. How can we start selling these machines, collaborate? What we do is a concept called distributive enterprise. That means the enterprise itself works on self-replicating. That means how do we set up others in business? Because a lot of times, you know, we can play, but how do you actually get mass creation of right livelihood c coming from all this work? And I think by putting our heads together here, we can do that, but it has to end up as people making real products that meet real needs, whether it's selling the machines or the products of the machines. Yeah, it's an interesting point. My older brother, Joel, who ran the National Labor Relations Organization, nicely describes it as machines that make machines need organizations that make organizations. Mm -hmm. And so um, da Danielle and Jens of Forces of Nature were able to turn machine building into creating their own entities. That's a pretty high threshold, though. Um, I, I, I would like to push, push back against this idea of having to create companies and sell things. I think that um, 
the, the nature of selling something will mean that you're going to have to have a market. And a lot of the things that are enabled by digital fabrication are because of markets of one. And so I think that we need to explore what the lowering of threshold looks like to be able to have things like a market of one be viable. And I think selling might not be part of that. But the um, selling can be um, uh, doesn't have to mean so you know, if you take uh, Blair's lab where a third of the time is traditional economy, a third of the time is post economy barter exchange, a third of the time is for human transformation, improving the community, or the Bhutan GNH. The notion of economy doesn't have to equal jobs equals work equals money. I think underlying the question was sustainability in organization. And there's an opportunity to revisit what those means. Again, what I find interesting is I thought the end of the session would be about things like sharing networking microcode, but it, you know, what Martin is raising is sort of sharing how you build sustainable organizations around the machine building. Where are all the lay days? I see only men. Yes, that's a serious issue, Adia. <laughs> what the snap, Neil? What have you been doing? Well, no, but what's interesting is the Fab Academy student class is 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 pretty well balanced. Oh, hi. Uh, Wait, your name is Hank? Um, uh, the Fab, no, this is interesting. The Fab Academy student group is nicely balanced. Um, it just, this recitation has attracted it, uh, a fairly imbalanced. Bad job, Neil. Bad. Um, you better. Ben, you're you're going to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just to, to mention that what's kind of exciting in our is we managed to have local freelancers in our community download our files and sell these machines customized for local clients. So, for instance, the machine that you got demo that is high school was not built by me or Jakob uh, or Fulberg, but it was built by a local freelancer in the community in Oslo and sold as commercial so onto, the, onto the machine as a kid. So, and so you have like a customizability yeah, and like a engagement with community as service rather than saying like we have to build a product that lots of people need to buy. I can add something on my side. Um, I mean, anything like this lab or my activities have been planned before. I just started building one machine, and that uh, was useful for somebody else that wanted to build it and bootstrap everything. Um, so from this perspective, I'm building the machine together with the students now, and this is uh, quite substantial, uh, let's say, side activity that can bring footer and footer maybe machine building in the future. But again, what I'm struck by is just, again, taking Jens and Danielle, each of you bootstrapped an organization around your machine building that you're running sustainably and creating spaces for many other people. And there's as much knowledge in how you did that as how you make the machine to share that we haven't been taking it seriously. work and the kinds of the kinds of technologies that we develop that enable them you know if everybody has to do a bunch of, has to have expertise in a bunch of different fields to be able to contribute to this at all then obviously we're not going to be broadly adapt, adopted and accessible and so there um, you know usability and broad access is almost more important than really shows of crazy machine bravado so um, we're just at the verge of another hour. So just to step back, uh, we've seen a beautiful tour of machines to machines making machines to fab labs making fab labs to bootstrapping civilizations. And in response to some of the questions in the chat, 
there's a traditional uh, equivalence of jobs equals work equals money equals consumption. If you both pull all of this together, you can revisit those assumptions and how a society functions, which is really at the heart of the pandemic response and the idea of building back better. So uh, in, in the small, I'm fabulous fans, I bow down before all of you for your, these machine building virtuosos. You all share a special gene. Um, many people can reproduce what you do. There's a subset of people that can create what you do. Uh, in the medium, I think we're very close to Fab Labs making Fab Labs. It's really time to make that happen. Um, and in the large, this is the infrastructure to bootstrap the civilization. Uh, the, you know, the, the grandest of challenges for all of us. Uh, so with that, I will stop the recording. But I don't think the video, actually, um, but, but applaud all of the machine builders. Uh, oh. Hi, guys. Uh, hi, no, we just want to say that uh, there are nerds here and also very nice nine for the group of segments. <laughs> uh, great. great. And, and in fact, fact um, I was going to say, I'm going to keep this video running if people want to keep asking as much as you want. But, um, uh, uh, Nadia, just, just Hank, Hank is the instructor in the VOG, um, um, but this, this is a group doing great, uh, great work in the VOG. Hi, VOG. Thank you, Domitianus. So thank you so much for this event. Yeah, we did. Yeah. It's actually moving now. Um, yeah, yeah, not, not it. It. Each week when we do the assignments, there's been a VOG group that, like, if the assignment is here, does this. Move your video. Damn up, damn up. I'm going to have to drop off again, but I'll post it to you after this, and I, I just adore the work you're all doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, you didn't show your um, milling machine printing. No, I, uh, uh, I'm not in Norway. I, uh, my, my girlfriend's been sick of Oxford for recovering from COVID, which has been a bit rough. Uh, so I actually traveled via Amsterdam last week. So after getting six consecutive direct flights canceled, I decided to go via Amsterdam, spent a, a night in Amsterdam and, uh, and went on to Oxford last week. So, so uh, but, uh, the good thing is she's recovering very well, and uh, and the other good thing is I have uh, a three D printer uh, in the mail coming to me, <laughs> so I can continue to make stuff. Uh, Do you have any plans in pallet printing? Yes, it's it's. I'm so interested in this, and it's been all I to do this for such a long time. I even have an idea how I can use uh, trochoidal milling to make uh, the feeder, you know, the extruder. So to, to, to do a DIY for faxes and then to call the milling to create, you know, the, you have this very specific order profile, right, with compression. So the, the stem of the extruder is narrower in the start and then the stem gets faster towards the end. So you have both uh, friction as well as heat, uh, uh, heat to melt the pellets. And this is very much on my to-do list to play around with. And but for now, I decided to start easy with ready-made stuff. So I, lose, I have a loose spot extruder with a 1.2 millimeter uh, muscle. That, uh, that, that I've been using in combination with milling, which has been super fun. You can see on, on YouTube the link, uh, me making a saw attachment, having <laughs> entertaining myself. Hey guys. But I wanted to say actually well, that, you know, this machine, the wooden, the dirty ass wooden machine, I made it last year in my spare time in the lab, and then I brought it home for my sabbatical so I could fabricate in peace. So when the lockdown happened, I had my old floor of the lab in the house, so it felt like. I was, you know, in a certain degree, uh, living the wish in a way. Even more symbolic is, I used to have the shop up in my private design studio, right? And then I sold the shop up secondhand to our non-profit organization, the Fab Lab. And then after selling that shop up, then I used it to, to have the part for my own machine. <laughs> it took a year off. <laughs> yeah. There's something nice and poetic about that. Hey, I got a question for you, Jens. So, do you are you actually su self-supporting on the on the fab lab that you're running, or or what do you do for a living? 
Yes, so no, our attack lab is in 90% of the funding in the lab is municipal money and government money for cultural stuff. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, and I've been working full time uh, in, for this nonprofit. But before that, I was actually living the dream for a while, earning a living with open source design. So in my private, you know, commercial design company, I was doing open design. I had a shop out that I used to, to, to have custom local stuff while sharing mm -hmm. recipes online with the world and so on. So I, I did that for a while, but then I wanted to do the Fab Lab as a non-profit. And uh, we give free one-to-one -one guidance. And if we would charge, if we would charge for the one-to-one -one training we give, then so, such a small part of the community yeah. would be able to afford so, so, so that's, that's that here, they, here, here comes that uh, how to automate the teaching, right? So, so, people, so, so no, no, no self sustainable lab, but I have been self sustainable in practicing open design and open fabrication before. That's awesome. Hey, uh, so yeah, do you think we can collaborate? So, Daniela and you and ourselves uh, on some real products that can be marketable. I mean, do you guys think about mass creation of livelihood with open source or? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm very open to collaboration, and and I think it's super exciting what you're doing. And and we have in our money page in the wiki, we have described the model where we encourage we're playing with what I call like a gentleman's agreement, because if people are going to locally fabricate your tents, if you don't individually sign contracts and agreements with all these local fabricators, that's not scalable. So the sort of the little hit in my dream is that people will voluntarily share a very small percentage of the profits. So we encourage people to add 2%. So if people are going to quote the client or, or making a custom machine for them or non custom, then we encourage them to then they calculate the total cost of the quote, add 2% on top of that, that will go to the person that actually designed it. And, and I earned a, a few thousand dollars with that, not much. Uh, sh can you send me a link to that? Point me yes, to that? Yes, I'll do that in the chat right now. And another thing that is really fun is I got very interested in steel. For some reason, I'm not a big fan of aluminum extrusions and all this, you know, machining and tie gantries in from sheet materials and aluminum takes forever. And I just regular, you know, rectangular sections of steel uh, is something I'm very interested in and it's super cool we're working a lot with steel. And also, uh, I, I got very into like epoxy leveling, so if you can bolt and weld everything together and then use gravity with slow curing epoxy, is that the way to bootstrap uh, the most precise machine without having an even bigger machine to machine the platform? Mm -hmm. It's all on the dream, the dream list now, but no action yet. Yeah. <laughs> but there is, I'll, put the, I'll put the link in the repo, there is a free CAD, I have free CAD files in the repo of this, so I'll, I'll send the link to that too. Yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing the steel uh, square extrusion profiles. One, one thing I wondered about is are the extrusion steel profiles are or welded, you know, there's, there's different types. Are they the same size in every country? country? Is it standardized? So, like, Jens, do you use the same size steel extrusion as we'd use in the United States? I, my answer there would be that's why it needs to be parametric, that you go into the spreadsheet in FreeCAD and pick it, you know, then update, you know, yeah. these are, this is. Oh, then you can use any kind of profile that's available locally. I'm really interested in that too. That these steel, steel uh, tubes, square tubes, they seem really powerful to me and easy to uh, source. And then eventually, you'd want to make them yourself, right? You want to build a machine yeah. that makes it. Yeah, I mean, our our goals are yes, we are taking an induction furnace and metal rolling, so we're making our own profiles at the end of the day. So we'd like to get there within about three three to five years. Where in a small four thousand square foot facility you're starting from scrap metal. Yeah, I'm very interested, uh, uh, Marcin, is that how you pronounce your name? Marcin. And you're Dan, Marcin. you're from Chicago Hackerspace? I'm, I'm from uh, Chicago, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, and I'm, I'm very involved in the hackerspace. So I'm interested in taking your model and applying it to a city. I think it's really yeah. practical. You're in an urban area, correct? Or no, I'm a rural. Rural, we're one hour outside of Kansas City. Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, and I'll talk, talk to you later about that. that. And, and I think Nadia, Nadia brought up something, too, that kind of ties in with this. Like, we're kind of trapped by this uh, capitalist system that requires, you know, always going for a job. And what I'm interested in is tr is slowly transforming towards what you're doing in a rural area, but do that on a city level. And yeah. Chicago, I think, has some advantages because we, we make so much stuff here. Mm. And I want to democratize that uh, manufacturing structure in Chicago and... We've had some experiments with that, but 
Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's. I think those two things, things are related to what yeah. I was talking about earlier, and what, then what, what you're doing. doing. What kind of experiments have you started on that? The first one was in uh, 2012, where we built uh, 14 rep wraps from uh, cast parts. So we bought molds, and then we made all the parts from nodes. So that was the first moment where I saw that we built a massive amount of machines for back then, hmm. all once together at a hackerspace, Pumping Station 1, and that was a huge... always dreamed of taking what you see in factories and applying that to uh, other systems like hackerspaces and then the fab lab came along a little later and I'm like wow this is <coughs> this is a route and I wonder if Nadia could speak to that a little bit too She's uh, still on. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think that they're you know scaling through people is not necessarily efficient. And I think the benefit of doing that is the educational component. So when you get people to build machines, they learn about building machines and then can do all kinds of things with machines. So it's not so much that we want, you know, a hundred identical 3D printers, but that once you have people who are doing system integration across mechanical, like electrical and software systems, but then you can automate all kinds of different things and that you can do all kinds of different things. And that's, I think, really the important component. Like, how do you make sure that education continues? And also, how do you make sure that the infrastructure that we use for these machines becomes more accessible, not just by becoming cheaper, but also by becoming really usable? Yeah, and I think that if we need to make sure that women are included in that process big time, we have to, I, my opinion is you have to really focus on making sure that you're advertising your workshops to women groups and really work hard. And the, the hackerspaces in Chicago have made a lot of progress there for women and non-cisgendered people. And it's really exciting to see that. And you have to, every week you have to work on it in order yeah, for I think that to happen. You always have to make sure, and it's not just women, but all kinds of people who are underrepresented in these communities yeah. um, are constantly reminded by small things that they don't belong, and you have to actively work against that constantly. Yeah, and this, and this this call today is just dominated by men. It's like really, that's not that's not welcoming. Nadia, what what suggestions would you would you have for us? You, I think you uh, rebelled against the bravado of large machines. Oh, I love large machines. I think that it's a, the rebellion that I have is against things that are really difficult to use. And that sometimes because you want so much to do something very specific, that then you forget that it needs to be usable or extensible or modular. And I think, you know, there it's what scales the community? I think, first of all, all Fab Lab is about community. And then Fab Lab is about events where community can come together. And then it's about spaces where people can have events and come together in community. And only after that, it's about machines. And so how do you, how do you create community and sustain community and, and allow for learning and allow for experimentation and the exchange of knowledge? And I think that there you have to, you have to explicitly invite people to do that and tell them that they are welcome. People who just show up and want to be like, they're like, oh, like this is a this is a space where I have access to tools and I can make the thing that I've always wanted to make. That's a very specific kind of person, and maybe we are all that kind of pe person, but we need to be um, broadly accessible to all kinds of other people too. People who maybe don't think that their application is worthwhile or don't think that their um, their machine is important or you know that that kind of that kind of space. That's a very good point, because that was my experience also. It's just because you tell people they're welcome doesn't mean that they feel welcome. It's a super tricky thing to make yeah, to make it not scary or intimidating to go to, to a lab to do stuff. And how, how do you address that? So what, what's your action points? It's a good question. It's very much about uh, inductions. It's one of the most important things. So once people are finally at your space, how they receive the first few minutes is one of the most sort of precious and 
and valuable things. So everybody who either working or volunteering in this space should be very aware of those precious few moments of inductions. And then and then a certain degree also just like make an atmosphere that radiates by the what you call the jungle telegraph in Norway, like that by word of mouth that people understand what kind of space this is just by how people talk about it. So instead of you know, so so it, it's it's so difficult to force, but by by practicing sort of what you keep from being who we are, then sort of slowly uh, that, that, that it helps. But, but definitely, I uh, haven't solved it like that. Do this, this, this. I'm not even sure. Yeah, the introduction is absolutely critical. We found that in the uh, Chicago hacker space scene that that those first few moments um, that you have to introduce and welcome and include and. Uh, then you start to get a reputation for being welcoming to diverse groups, and that really that's really the basis for everything after that. There's hard work after that too, of course, but I've uh, been really uh, happy to see the impact of that in the Chicago area hackerspaces. And there's other cities too that that have had success with this, and it gets talked. I think it gets talked about more practically in the hackerspace scene than it does the Fab Lab network. This accessibility part, I could be wrong. And then in the rural open source ecology, what does the demographics look like out there? Do you have uh, some women and other non-white males involved in your community? And what, what have you done in that area to, to help? Or what, what, is it, what does it look like now today? Ourselves, you're asking about us? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a perennial issue. We're, we try to, in some of our event announcements, we're saying women are welcome, people of all ages, young and old, uh, but demographics are not not too good um no s s similar like a couple of women few few women really skewed gender ratio so no we're in the middle of like nowhere missouri like this is like meth labs and and like s large uh commercial agriculture around us corn and soybeans so it's like we see this as if we succeed like our first mark would be the town that's right here, which is a thousand people showing that people actually can start building stuff. And we haven't, we're not there yet. It's like all our audiences from our, from all over the world, people descend to here. We got to start doing an impact right here as well. That, that would be our first measure of success, really. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky at the, at where I work at the museum that, the, that we we have a situation where we can target our announcements uh, to a diverser audience and uh, like for our summer camps for example there are more than 50 percent uh, women at this time but uh, that takes a concerted effort over a number of years to make sure that we're making sure that the summer camp which is usually it's a technical summer camp with making things that usually in the initial days it was dominated by boys and over a period of three years we finally got it to 50 percent but it took three years to actual focus and making sure that we uh, support the girls in the summer camp. And the same thing with our teen programs. It takes a couple years to get there. But once you establish that, you have a reputation and uh, it starts to starts to balance out. That's okay. Uh, Chicago Makerspace. That's awesome, Jim. I, I gotta leave. I gotta leave everyone. So nice to see you all in line yeah. and again. I hope to catch up in not too long. Am I seen? I'm gonna get back to your emails. I'm sorry for the delay, but definitely Let's... I'll get back to you. And and let's 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 see how we can collaborate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's yeah, thank yeah. you. Great to meet you guys. Yeah, yeah. and oh, also Daniela, yes. I want to come visit you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think guys, if you pass around about um, the border with Holland, close to Fellow or Dusseldorf. Yeah. Um, I mean, the upper floor is still not re uh, um, renewed, but once it's renewed, there are going to be some uh, beds. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I'll just come and see and see my own my own bed, you know. Sure, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. <laughs> Daniela. Bye, bye. Uh, yeah. So, are you supporting yourself full time by running the Fab Lab, or do you work elsewhere? Uh, well, I have permanent job at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this is some kind of side activities. Um, but I have, uh, let's say, um, I had a good equilibrium, and I still try to have one mm -hmm. because uh, my boss always encouraged my experimentations and gave yeah. me a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I would rather like not count only of these side activities, of course. Um, but my way of scaling up is, of course, even like on the side of like having more fun. I, I take it from this side, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not only from the side of changing the civilization and so on. It's just going by the wind of passion. Um, yeah. 
enabling the others and so on. So this link that I just sent, for example, from a Tunisian student, he was uh, participating in one of my workshops. Uh, he was already a machine builder before, but just to tell you that we have all network, even aside from the fab lab, of people like building and building and building. So I would like to scale up a lot uh, and help like a lot of contexts with machine building, which can be like countries that cannot afford like proper machining of, from one side, or finally removing the commercial machines from the fab lab inventory. Yeah, yeah. Um, and having the, the machines uh, self-made, self-fabricate. Um, but, but I still believe that as well for my machine that I'm trying to push very hard to make them as stable as possible, this step will take still some, some time to develop. Yeah, so I mean, let's I, work. I mean, let's like collaborate on that part. Like, I mean, for one thing, okay, we, can we, for example, try something like trying our universal access with, like, for example, on your laser? Because I think we can do it cheaper and as good performance with steel and the more simple techniques that we use, like like we do. You think we can collaborate on that maybe? Yeah, sure. I will be glad to spend some extra time to experiment with all of your axes. Uh, but one side of my philosophy is if something is already cheap and available and also sourceable worldwide, I mean, I still prefer to, to buy this part instead of making them. Otherwise, my machines will take ages to be made yeah. uh, from yeah. one perspective. Yeah. So I'm a little bit like, okay, I, it's convenient for me to make it. It's better performance if I make it. Okay, then I will make it. It's cheaper, better, and faster buying it, and then maybe I will still buy it. So I'm not of that like 100% uh, self-made machine. I mean, we can reach that point. We can look at that point, but I need also to have some uh, some yeah. objectives, some uh, some goals that I want to realize. Yeah, sure. yeah, it has to be practical. Yeah, we gotta make it. Mm -hmm. I think lots of different applications are cool to explore there. It's not just like machines that we're used to seeing in fab labs, but other kinds of machines, like things for agriculture, things for uh, pandemic response, or things you know, things that yeah. have other applications. How do remotely? to master students and they all have they all bought ender 3 pros and are running machines at home or like they're learning cad 3d printing casting that kind of stuff and uh, that that price like 200 dollars for a machine that price point when i was a master student was like completely outrageous like that wasn't so given like the broad availability of lots of different kinds of things like cheap extrusion or um, whole machines or controllers or motors, what are ways in which we can push forward making automation and its applications um, easy to customize and adapt mm -hmm. to like the current pressing needs of society. Yeah. Yeah, that's nope. actually one of the ones we've had success with. Uh, there's a lot of maker bots out that are broken <laughs> when going to schools, and they're used as bookshelves. It's hilarious. Same thing with laser cutters, too. It's shocking. <laughs> there's, like, books stored in them in schools, right? And so the problem is, is they've broken. And then, and actually, for this is one of the success we've had with women, fixing stuff. So you take that busted thing and then fix it and rip out the original controller and put in a different brain fix it and get it running and that's really empowering so you, it's easier to start with something that already exists and that you already have and costs nothing or you're right the machines are so cheap you know start with those it's less intimidating the instructions are already there and then you move into this more advanced building um you know like something like jake designed that's you need to work your way up to that that sort of machine building mm -hmm. and can we also use them in different ways uh Neil and I love to dislike G code for different reasons, but how can you control machines to do really different things? You know, like when you have a laser cutter and you can never move like Z and X at the same time with any laser cutter software, like what the snap? Why not? Danielle, help us. <laughs> oh, you, you can move mine simultaneously. That's not ah, very good. <laughs> and so what can you do with that? You know, what is the, what is the, but how can we start cutting on curved surfaces? Like, what do we need to develop to make cutting on curved surfaces something that is broadly accessible? As opposed to saying like, oh, well, first you make a whole model of the surface, and then you make a whole hack to be able to create the right G-code, and then you start running it. No, 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 not like that. <laughs> As I'm really sorry, I have to leave. Just an embrace to everybody. Yeah. And see you, I hope, uh, by presence. Yep. Bye, friend. So long. Bye-bye.
Nadia, is your kinematic mount, is that all open source, Ashra compliant and all that? Yeah, I gotta drop off as well. It's good to see you guys. Bye, okay. Jake. Yeah. <laughs> see you, Jake. Uh, Ed time in Japan. Good to see you, Nadia. You're in Japan? I'm in Japan. Why? Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, uh, so I did Fab Academy at Kamakura Lab, and I'm, I'm oh, here. Oh, wait, I thought Dan was talking. Of course you're in Japan. <laughs> nope, Rico speaking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Dan, Nadia. Nadia. Nadia, can I interrupt? Is your uh, kinematic mount, that's all open source stuff, Ashwa compliant and all that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. What's I'm on your... the board of Ashwa. You're on a board? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Good job. Uh, <laughs> what are your goals with it? So you're, you're actively developing that right now? Working on mm -hmm. that? Or? Well, um, I think tool changing is interesting because then you can start doing a lot of multi-tool workflows. Mm -hmm. So, you know, multi-head 3D printing is a straightforward multi-tool workflow. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm doing increasingly more with scientific exploration and, and automation of scientific experiments, mm -hmm. not in the scale-up phase, but in the, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in this sort of creative problem solving and exploration phase. So how do you use machines in that phase? Mm -hmm. um, and tool changing lets you do just more kinds of machines, more kinds of um, workflows that have multiple steps. So you want to mix a bunch of different chemicals together and then sonicate them and then measure yeah. um, like the energy storage capacity of the mixtures that you produce. Or you're growing, we have a project right now where we're growing duckweed. Duckweed is like a really awesome plant organism that can do all kinds of really exciting things. But how do you, you know, tend it? How do you get it to grow in different ways? Um, so, you know. Nice. You need multiple tool heads to do things with robotic duckweed farming. Um, so that's why multi-tool, I think, is is interesting. So how do you do? Um, and, and broadly, I guess, I'm interested also in the whole workflow, not just, so if you think about a 3D printer, it's like you're 3D printing, but then there's a lot of things that happen before, design and like slicing, and there's a lot of things that happen after removing supports and finishing and like integrating it with other components and mm -hmm. and so how do you do these whole workflows with automation yeah. as opposed to saying we're going to do one thing with one machine and then take it out and put it in another there's a lot of manual steps that require then tacit knowledge and expertise and so mm -hmm. i'm interested in how do you scale up tacit knowledge especially without you know this sort of apprentice model where you're in a lab where you can learn tacit knowledge from someone else if you mm -hmm. don't have that how do you how do you rely on um, infrastructure that can enable that? Maybe we can use your duckweed robot to to feed our aquaponic greenhouse. That's what we do. That. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right now, the duckweed robot is growing only very small amounts of duckweed. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, if you have a lot of hungry fish, it might be. A yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's the? I mean, as far as the code for that, are you doing all that all custom, or what's the for the auto auto tool change, or is there any open source that supports that? Um, the we we're using the Duet um, right now for moving for changing between the tools, and there it's just like a addition to the firmware. So in G code, there's just mm -hmm. an additional code. So if you say T zero, it switches to tool zero, and you switch to T one which is to tool one. Um, mm -hmm. And that that's just like the locking and the unlocking and the switching of the tool. Um, you know, if that's supported that, in Marlin by any chance or because we, we use Marlin. Yeah, we use Mar so oh, that's that's Marlin. So Marlin? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. So we can. No, I'd love we to... contributed the Core XY motion kinematics to Marlin so everyone can use parallel control. You did that? Yeah. Good job. Good job. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd love to replicate the multi-tool. I mean, I, I want to be able to do things like, you know, your tool change on a circuit milling and then 3D printing and all that in one. Have you done anything like where you're interchanging between, uh, say, like circuit fab and 3D printing or anything like that? Or Yeah, so the milling tool head that we had like an experimental milling tool head for Jubilee. Joshua, Joshua Vasquez, one of my students, developed this milling tool head, but it would it, um, it basically is like the belts, the fact that the machine is made with timing belts means that you can't really mill large components. So for milling a circuit board where you have a tiny end mill, um, 
where you have a tiny end mill and you're moving really, and your RPMs are really high, then it's okay. But for any other kind of milling, yeah. which I'm sure Dan is more excited about, uh, it's not necessarily as good. Um, and so we haven't been doing things like where we 3D, where we made circuit boards and then did pick in place and then 3D printed over it. But what we, and I think that, you know, they, we're not even necessarily super excited about that as a process, but for example, um, shape net fab where you 3D print and you have some really critical components where tolerances are crucial that you can go in and then mill afterwards. So you 3D print like yeah. most of the material and then you and then you mill afterwards. That's like an application we're interested in, but there the little the little PCB spindle is not sufficient for doing um, for doing for doing that. So more more research in future focused on that. I think they're also, you know, you're constantly grappling with multi-tool that different tools have different requirements mm -hmm. in terms of like the amount of force they need to apply or um, the speed they need to be able to move at. You know, you can 3D print on a rack and pinion system, but it's inherently just going to be slower than 3D printing using a machine that's using timing belts. And so how do you reconcile all of these different and how do you make sure that people who are using machines for different applications um, learn about these trade offs? Yeah. That I find like a tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that the way you have designed the the mul the tool changer is it scalable? The the same kind of design you can enlarge it. Well, I mean, to an extent. So people, the most popular thing for people to do who have been replicating the work is to change the work envelope. Um, but you know, you're using fiberglass reinforced timing belts, and as soon as you get you know, you get to the size that, you know, Jake is operating at, you see significant stretch and backlash. And you can address those in software. You can address that kind of situation in software, but you have to implement those, uh, you have to implement that firmware and software. And so I would say, yes, you can scale it up and make it bigger, but probably if you wanted to do um, really large, so say you want to do like, you know, five by 10 foot, plywood sheet stock material size, I would say we'd have to go to a different kind of motion system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the tool changer itself, I think, is, is is not like the picking up and dropping off the tools, I don't think is a, uh, I don't think there's a limitation there. Is, is that well documented? I could pick that up from you and replicate it relatively easily? Yeah, yeah. There's also a bunch of different software like add-ons you can see in the on the wiki of how to do tuning and calibration. That's like a whole aspect of all of this that I mm -hmm. feel like we didn't even start talking about. Can tuning you, and calibration of machine. Can you put a link in the chat box on the auto tool yeah. changer? I want to do that. It I know you have a yeah. I have a Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. You can finish, Nadia. No. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Um, so I am. Uh, I avoided this for a while because I'm an expert in metal casting, but I'm now going to lean into it. And I'm really interested in machines that make patterns and molds for metal casting to make parts for machines. Like, a, I really want to build a lathe, an open source lathe that's heavy and can do like steel and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think I finally concluded casting is the way, which is how Gingery did it, which Neil mentioned earlier. But it, his machines are really hard to build. Like you gotta be like some kind of weird nerd garage machinist to build them. So I'm interested in making metal casting really accessible. And the best one I've seen so far is Foundry in a Box. It's by the American Foundry Society. And you use a microwave to melt all the metal. And I would like to do an open source foundry kit. So I feel like the open source foundry could be, yeah. it's not a machine, right? But that's very important. And the microwave metal casting can be done at home. It doesn't make, and they have this uh, sand that comes with it that uses two cycle oil, so it doesn't fume and smoke. So you can do it inside like a small apartment. So I'm interested in marching and making what you're doing, except doing it in a 500 square foot apartment, which is what I live in mm -hmm. usually. Yeah. And then uh, the next machine would be a foam CNC that makes patterns that you can smooth out with um, 
lightweight spackle that you use on walls, and then you could use that as a casting pattern. And then the next machine, I'm debating whether it's would be a lathe mill combo. I think that because you can make circuit boards on it, mm -hmm. but also round parts like. Building machines, the mo one of the most expensive things is those stupid little wheels and, 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 and bushings and stuff like that. We should be able to make those from scratch raw materials, kind of like the slide that Ian showed, like move as much as you can to the makeable side from the purchasable side. And then the other one I have a question about is, um, oh yeah, a comment more. Like during COVID-19, we went and got all our machines without permission from our institutions kind of snuck them out of there, like hundreds of them. I'm not joking across Chicago. Oh, wow. And we brought them home and we started making what we needed for COVID-19. It's the first time I've seen sort of what you're talking about, Nadia. We just made what we needed and we skipped all the systematic BS in between. It was exhilarating. It was also a little scary because some of us almost got fired for it. But once we had that momentum going and then the NIH started approving PPE, all of a sudden it tilted our direction again and they wanted to know how many parts we're making and they wanted to support us and then the money started flowing but that was an exci really exciting moment terrible and exciting moment at the same time and i think that accelerated what we can do in the future all of a sudden what we've talked about for years we just did it because we needed it right now and then i've seen that a couple times in the past um with my previous career unfortunately it had to do with making military hardware which i am after that experience i the war should be eliminated because you saw how we were just automating killing people basically so it was really exciting to see they use that for for a need during uh, uh the COVID 19 pandemic but yeah so i go back to my question uh Marchand, do you it looks like you do metal casting and i was on the open source ecology website a couple of days ago and i'm like wow this group looks really cool and then when you showed up i'm like wow that's awesome we get to talk to who's running that yeah um love to collaborate i've got more than enough ideas on this including the heavy duty lathes that we go with stock off the shelf supplies and high hyper modularity so for example you talk about a lathe add steppers and belt like basically a indexing head using a big chuck like a 12 inch chuck and three inch shaft with three inch bearings then put some metal structure around it you're pretty much good to go for as heavy duty as you'd like to go and make that into a CNC screw machine. That's one of the things we really like to do. So yeah, that's, a, um, that's one of the most powerful production machines. The screw machine you can just pop parts off it like yep. crazy to build other machines. Yep. So that's all a derivative of the universal axis and the large versions. I talked about two inch versions. Uh, we're, we also can get into the seventy five millimeter scale. So that's that's on the plan. So it's just a matter of when we get a chance to do it. And that's why, I, like Nadia, we talk about revenue because we we're bootstrapping this thing we're not funded by anybody so we're we're doing product sales to to basically bootstrap all the research yeah i guess like the there it's interesting to you know talk for real about how different people are funded and one of the things yeah. that i think um like insight focus in detroit is really successful with is not necessary like they do a lot of machine stuff but they're funded through education and community outreach, not through machines. Um, and if you look, you know, now in the United States, if you look at calls for grants from the federal government, a lot of them have to do with the future of work, the future of manufacturing, the future of, and so, you know, is there, is there a way in which we can leverage that kind of funding Instead of, you know, because when you, in my experience, when you sell machines, you're always going to run against the problem where someone is always going to be able to make things cheaper and faster than you are, unless you're like really focused on just doing that, like shaving margins and shipping product and, and innovating and making Or just doing open source. Of, right. And so doing like different kinds of um like di different possible kinds of machines and different kinds of workflows and all of that i think isn't really covered in in that like shipping product model. okay but he, he, and he let, likes to say let me back up that, you know lots of people from the fab lab do that but i don't really think that's true i think a lot of fab labs are funded by um by community education outreach 
Yeah. Question. That's exactly our model. We, we're combining the, we call it extreme manufacturing, where we do workshops. And as a result of the workshops, we produce a real thing like the house or a, a printer or a brick machine. So we do that and we'd like to push the limits of it. Tell me more about Insight Focus. Do they, um, are they pretty much programmatic revenue funded? Because that's, that's our model. We can't, we don't just want to do pro product. We're an education organization nonprofit. But we, ha we happen to do industrial products that, that meet or exceed industrial standards. Uh, but we're education. What is the link? Jubilee3D.com. Um, I feel like I'm pasting it over and over again. No, but uh, I was asking the direct link to the tool change part as opposed to the general project. But oh, okay. I couldn't really find it directly there. You have to go to the, then you have to go to the tool change part of the assembly instructions. Direct link, please. No, but I'm with you. Like we're we we are in education, and that's the revenue model we're exploring—the hybrid between education slash production. And the money's in education. I mean, the power. Let's say the power. The power is in education. That's how you change the world. That's that's why we're going for education. And you should talk to Blair Evans at Insight Focus, Marchand. Okay. He would be happy to talk to you. And he, it, it's a long conversation. Like he's been doing this. God, how long has he been doing it now? He, like longer than the Fab Lab Network almost. He's been doing this work. Like, no, and he, I think he's been doing it since 2010. Well, some of the stuff like the that Marchin's doing, where it's like uh, sustainable farming, and like a whole entire community. Yeah, he has a, a whole. Experience. He has a lot of stuff with permaculture and yeah. um, and you know Blair Blair is really focused also on. Um, black owned businesses and cultivating black owned mm -hmm. entrepreneurship in Michigan. Um, and, and, and there's a real like a uh, integration component, like a uh, education integration component to his work. Um, Can you connect me? I, I yeah. tried emailing him. He would, he didn't respond like uh, six months ago. I'll give you his phone number. Cause right now during COVID-19, he's completely overwhelmed. Like he's my, he's my guide guidance instructor. Okay. And we 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 decided to take a break for both our cities, Chicago and Chicago uh, and Detroit. Or so I'll send you his phone number and just awesome. call him leaving a voicemail. Excellent, excellent. He he did one of our boards for our early brick press a long time ago, like in 2010. Uh, but since then, I've lost contact with him. Yeah. No, that's great. I'll send you his his, his uh, number privately here. Yep. I should probably do other work, guys. Yeah. Been yeah. Fun. Well, Nadia, thank you. Great to meet you. We haven't really talked before live, but it's great. Nice to meet you too. Thank you, everybody. Nice Bye to see you. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can possibly wrap up. Uh, Dan, so let's follow up as well. Um, yeah. You can. You got my email. <laughs> Obama Shield. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, then my yes. I must so just email me there, and yeah. then um, then I'll send you Larry Evans' uh, information Excellent. through there. I'll, I'll double check with him too to make sure it's okay. Yeah, let's follow up on some potential collaboration, including COVID, because we're we're pretty much gearing up to produce stuff for that as well. We've been we're actually doing a high temperature chamber for the three D printer. So we're talking 160 C. So uh, basically, where everything is outside the heat zone, uh, that that's relevant for higher higher power print. I mean, basically, expanding to all the materials, high temperature materials. That's one thing too. Oh, then that way they could be uh, sterilized with high temperature later, like autoclaving and stuff. Yeah, or even just the very yeah. basic concept that, like, without heated or enclosed chambers, things like. A polycarbonate or nylon. I mean, you can't really print with that. You need a fully enclosed and high temperature chamber. So yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty that. interested in it. Like, you know, I understand that you 3D print and then usually go to injection molding. Yes, of course. But I was shocked at how much production and how flexible it was was done on 3D printers in Chicago. You know, you're talking yeah. eighty thousand face shield frames were printed across hundreds of 3d printers across chicago and then we could change the design in minutes yeah and then we went to hard tooling 
later, um, we went to a steel rule die. And what's interesting there is we started punching out face shields on that, the um, Solon flat pack, which was inspired some of the, by that, some of the MIT work. Um, we don't have enough money to keep that die running. We run out of budget because it can run so fast, that die. So it's an interesting balance between, you know, moving it into traditional manufacturing. And then also moving parts around got harder from out of factories. Whereas with the 3D printers, we just drop them off on people's doorsteps. We had a distributor network where we wouldn't have contact. And those actually move faster than from the traditional manufacturing. Yeah. What are you so doing for the actual uh, face shield part? Just using... We just use trans transparencies. Yeah. And that, what is it, like so 10 cents a sheet? or? Um, yeah, so my total cost for a complete face shield with the transparency, the 3D printed frame, and elastic, which I started sourcing uh, the elastic locally um, as well, which helps with supply chain. And it's uh, 43 cents per face shield. Now you're talking about, now we're talking about selling them and then paying people for the labor of assembling them and 3D printing them, yeah. which is what we need when exactly. the, we recover our economy. Um, so it's amazing. And uh, You guys are moving forward shocked. with that? Uh, yeah, paying we people actually, to we actually we created a nonprofit two weeks ago, and uh, it's its own separate nonprofit now called the uh, Illinois Distributed Manufacturing Network. Um, nice. And I'm on the board of directors, and that happened that happened in two months. From you know, in two months, a whole entire organization with leaders and people who are effective at getting stuff done were created. It was just, it's just amazing. Nice. Well, maybe we can uh, maybe we can uh, set up a branch here. I mean, can we do that? Can we collaborate on that? Yeah, that's what we, uh, and uh, like we were talking on the call here. That's the most important part is sharing in a way that other people can duplicate it. So we've been yeah. spending a lot of time communicating what we did, so it can be duplicated. And yeah, and there's other models too that we're learning from too around the world. Um, that's what's so cool about the Fab Lab network is that I could get online and I could see everybody making PPE through the video feed. Mm -hmm. And that also mm -hmm. verified them that other people are thinking the same thing. Like at first, I'm like, should I really be doing this? Am I going to get sued? Stuff like that. And then I'm like, oh no, FabLab Fensens is making tons of face shields, and they're just doing what's needed. Um, and then just being inspired by that, and having, you know, I ran a 3D printer farm of 20 printers for three months, and I made. Mm -hmm. there and i think that we're talking about doing this all the time now sorry like sorry can you repeat i my my computer shut here uh you did you did a farm for three months and then yes i had a 20 3d printer farm in a spare um area of my apartment building the the uh landlord was really cool within four hours they approved me using a room that i could walk down to because having 20 3d printers in my 500 square foot apartment would be kind of rough we would have lost our minds. And so, so me and my spouse, Gaddy, um, Gaddy said, why don't you go, why don't you ask the landlord if he can use one of these spare rooms that's that we're not using because every, they're closed down because we can't meet in, in common areas. And so I installed 20 3D printers there. And with some of Gaddy's help, most of the time I was running it, I made 7,000 face shields, complete face shields in, actually it was two months. Nice. On that, on those 20 3D printers, one person, essentially, I could have done it because I was doing other work, like I'm managing my team back at the museum at the Fab Lab. I have a team of, you now we have a team of uh, four. We, mm -hmm. we lost one person because of cutbacks. But um, so I was doing normal work plus running this farm. And they would do 11 hour runs. So I'd, they'd run for 11 hours straight and make a stack. And actually, they were too small to do frames. So mm -hmm. I actually bent them inward so that they would fit into the small machines. And then I shared that design with the Illinois PPE network and hundreds of small printers came online because of that design. Nice. And then you put them in the, uh, you put them in the oven and you bend them out. And then I use my bigger printers to make fixtures to hold them. And then I distribute the fixtures to the other smaller printers. So it was, wow, sh it was still, yeah, still we're still going. Great. Um, unfortunately, I have another meeting uh, coming in, so I have to end this one. But I'm, I'm glad to see you were talking that whole time. That's great. Yeah, yeah. This is good. awesome, Neil. Yeah, yeah. OK, good, awesome good to meet. Look forward to whatever comes out of this. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Neil. We, we all have contact information, so we can drop off. 
Yeah. Uh, I like. One question though, like, okay, you said you're inspired by the the FabLab network. Does a does a person, an average person, have access to that, sorry, or you have to uh, be in I a have network? To because I, I, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. You have your contact. I need to use this meeting for another meeting. Okay, okay, right now. okay. Let's we'll do another sorry. Zoom. All right, we'll, another zoom meeting. we'll continue. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. years ago. So what we're seeing here is the, the page uh, of our repository, Fabricatable Machines is the name of the project. And it comes from uh, our first publication out. Uh, uh, under 10 minutes per topic. And there's in one of the results for both of you is built. And using that machines or the and, um, uh, three. I'm taking it through. Hi, uh, wait, your name is Hank? And that's uh, done with the entire system. So we've d done things like prototype the 3D printer, houses, brick presses, power cubes, tractors, and other machines. But yeah, it's a big ambitious project I've been working on for a decade. Right now we have a couple of products. Like, and here I, I emphasize this is the universal axis. So this is our our version of a of an item, the X Y Z axis that can be put into printers. These are actually printers we sell right now. So this is the D3D Pro, which has got the standard gantry system on top and uh, Zs like this. Or you can do a very simple machine with three axes just like this. And I think different than, and I challenge everybody in the a, in a crew here, we have 14 unique parts in the universal axis. So we claim this is the simplest thing in the world that you can do but uh, I'd like to see the part count for the other ones myself. So you can actually scale this. This is a six foot tall machine that we built uh, or this one cubic meter printer that we built using the same small eight millimeter axis, but then we can scale up. We can go up to uh, the same axis, same concept, but take a larger rod, like a one inch 25 millimeter rods to do large, larger items like this CNC torch table. So it's another thing, we, this is 2017. Or you can even scale that up, the same kind of concept of rods and bushings to do two inch or 50 millimeter size axes for heavy duty CNC, such as this uh, project. We didn't finish the 